I have some, for those who don't have a, a copy, I have some copies of the reading list, which, oh, I have them all. Oh, yeah, we're Chris. We'll have You're online. Hoarding. We'll put online soon. Okay. And there are uh, uh, links to, uh, Thank you. to the readings for those who don't have them yet. Uh, last time we began discussing the Castellanos essay, of course, people hadn't had a chance to read it yet, so it was just a brief introduction to some of the, the key things. Uh, I think most of the time we emphasize this question of, of self creation, that democracy is, the possibility of democracy presupposes. the community becoming conscious of itself as the creator, as a self-creation. Because obviously we, it's a, it, it is a given that all societies are self-created, but not all societies understand themselves as being self-creations. So this is a, a necessary presupposition, you could say. Democracy is not possible unless the community understands itself as the author of its own history, as that which constitute a self-constituted creation. And then from there, um, we started getting into some of the, for me, the, the one of the, the values of this essay from Castellanos. It gives a little bit, of course, introduction to his ideas of, of the radical imagination and uh, uh, the creative activity of, of, uh, of, of, of humans. But also, it, it serves as a guide, in a way, when reading something like Aristotle, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, how not to read, or how you know what common mistakes people make in ascribing modern ideas in political realities to the ancient texts. In, in particular, I think these three, beginning on page 107, but I think those who have this version on the PDF, I'm not sure what the. Uh, there are no numbers. Is it before yeah. or after is the, like one that the begins, listing where it, it says the yeah, one, no, two, the three? No, the listing, one, two, three. Oh, that's where yeah. you're starting. Yeah, in okay. particular. Except the numbering was. Yeah, there was, was no, there is this the title. Right. Right. It's just one, three, and four. Just, oh, that's right. Yeah. The two yeah. was yeah. missing. Yeah, but. Three is two and four. That's right. That's right. So nothing was missing. Oh. Oh, then they whoever I see. It's a typo. Yeah. Oh, it's a typo, really. Yeah. So we're not missing. No, it's only three. So you have four, but the two is missing. Yeah. Yeah. Two is missing. Three is two, and four is three. Sound like Dostoevsky. That was the underground. I like that. No, you sound like Rumsfeld. Yeah, Rumsfeld, even better. The known knowns and the known unknowns. The unknown unknowns. Yeah. The unknown knowns. That's the the Jujeki and the. So what? Tell me this again. That's hilarious. One is what? One is one. One is one. Two is two. So two, no, two is no three. Two is three. There's no two. There is a four. Two. Is four? I know in the book, no. but I mean on the There's only three. Four so is they three. skipped two. They went one, three, four instead of one, two, three. Right. That's three all. next to four and two next to three. Like that. It doesn't one, matter. Three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. So the it's, Greek. It's oh, you one. got the regular. You got the right one. I see. No, she yeah. fixed it. it it's no, just fixed. a typo. They wrote. They typed three instead of two. <laughs> It's very complicated. <laughs> no, it goes for me from Levi Strauss to history is creation. First, how can we understand? And then that No, it's three it's a list of three things. It's the people versus representatives. Yeah, I don't have that. Then it's the people versus the experts. Then it's the Laser. community versus the it's state. At the end of the handout. Keep going. Oh, it's at the end. Yeah, keep going. How can one and three? Go. Oh, got I see. Right here. Oh, <laughs> page I see. Page. I got you. Oh, it went way in the back. <laughs> so it should be in the front. <laughs> no. No, it's no. no, no, it's right. It's right? Yeah. It's oh, that's just a it list. <laughs> okay, just a list. Just, okay, that's the point. You're overthinking this. I'm this. overthinking this. That's right. Very good. So he gives a list of three <laughs> distinctions. Which even itself, to say, for example, the people versus representatives, I mean, he's using it in a very loose way because uh, 
Aristotle, for example, there is no a notion of the, pe the people in Aristotle, for example. What is often translated as, as people, if you look at the original, it's usually plethos, which means the many or the multitude. There's no notion, of course, of the many who are the one. You know, the the people in that sense, in, Ho in the Hobbesian sense, or of course in the American sense, the pluribus unum and, and these kinds of things. Uh, in Hobbes, of course, famously, there's the, the image on the cover of Leviathan, the many who become the one. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist in the contemporary world, precisely because there is no notion, or one of the reasons why, because there is no uh, element of representation when it comes to democracy. Even when it comes to aristocracy, when you have elections, you don't elect someone to represent you. You elect someone because they are the best. So you elect them not to, to uh, reflect your interests or your judgment, but for them to pass their own judgment over the issues because they are, they are the ones with the best judgment. So I think it's worth going over these three points before we get into the Aristotle, yeah. as a kind of guide what not to understand through some of these ideas. And this, number one, we started through last time, but let's, let's repeat it. He says here, direct democracy has been rediscovered or reinvented in modern history every time a political collectivity has entered a process of radical self-constitution and self-activity. Town meetings during the American Revolution, sections during the French Revolution, the Paris Commune, the Workers' Councils, or the Soviets in their original form. Hannah Arendt has repeatedly stressed the importance of these forms. In all these cases, the sovereign body is the totality of those concerned. Whenever delegation is inevitable, delegates are not just elected, but subject to permanent recall. I want you to remember that for classical political philosophy, the notion of representation is unknown. For Herodotus, as well as for Aristotle, Democracy is the power of the vimos, un unmitigated in matters of legislation and the designations of magistrates, not representatives, by sortition or rotation. Scholars merely repeat today that Aristotle's preferred constitution, what he calls politia, is a mixture of democracy and aristocracy, and forget to add that for Aristotle, the aristocratic element <coughs> in this politia is the election of the magistrates. For Aristotle clearly and repeatedly defines election as an aristocratic principle. Then he goes on Montesquieu, or so on and so forth. So this we had also uh, noted last time. So any notion of democracy in Aristotle, for example, means that people are directly involved in, as he terms it, a citizen is, is someone who shares in the holding of public office. And it's only in a direct way. There cannot be representative democracy or indirect democracy. It's a contradiction in terms. It is unthinkable in, uh, in the world of Aristotle or the world of Athenian democracy. Can, cannot have it. What you can have is some kind of combination, as Aristotle says, of aristocracy with democracy, where you have positions <coughs> filled by, by lottery and then some filled by elections. And with the elections, there is a, a presupposition of not everyone being equal when it comes to fulfilling that function, which goes to point number two, I think, which is a very important point. Uh, Before you go there, it's yes. got a great sentence. Uh, it is Rousseau, not Marx, who writes that Englishmen believe they are free because they elect their parliament. But in the reality, they're only free yes. one day every five years. Right. So this should be repeated for the midterms, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, the, the, the genius of the American system is that not everyone is up for election at the same time. So that's right. Not, you know, that's another good thing. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Keeps them busy a little longer. The six and yeah. Oh, there's never, you know, there's, there's always someone is up there, you know, running the. Well, in the House, the there is every two years. Yeah. Only a third of the Senate. I just, I just had a point of clarification or discussion. So, just to be clear, for for um, Castoria, this and and he's taking probably from Aristotle and all that is that representation has no place in the idea of democracy. For not only that, they had no notion of it. That's the right. idea that someone could represent. 
because, for example, uh, one, one issue in understanding the classical and the contemporary division, you know, how separate things might be, is, is the notion of corruption. What is a corruption? So, for example, we'll talk about a little bit. Aristotle says three, uh, the three ideal kinds of constitution can be corrupted. Right? Kingship can become tyranny, aristocracy can become oligarchy, and uh, polity can become democracy, or politia. And we'll explain what that means a little while later. Uh, people often go to those arguments and say, you see, the ancients had a notion of corruption similar to the contemporary idea. They thought that people can be. And in fact, there are many, many terms in ancient Greek that refer to influencing through the giving of gifts, none of which are negative. There's only one that is negative. And it's negative because someone has lost their autonomy as a thinker, in which case they no longer exist as an, as an autonomous individual, but as an adjunct to another subjectivity. So if you are hired, let's say, as a, if you're a lawyer and I hire you as a lawyer, you no longer exist, you're no longer functioning as an autonomous individual, now you're functioning on my behalf. That, uh, that idea they had, but one could not be at the same time, you, in a concrete sense, and a neutral representative of some kind of other set of ideas. What does that mean? For example, today, I mentioned last time, the police in ancient Athens had to be slaves. You cannot be a citizen and be in a position of coercive authority over another citizen, because number one, that negates the principle of equality. Now you're no longer equal. And number two, the Sub, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, servility presupposed by being a police or by being a technician, let's say in that sense, is in conflict with the kinds of subjectivities necessary for a citizen. Because to be a citizen, as Aristotle says, you have to be educated in a way that you can rule and be ruled in turn. And someone who is only ruled over is inappropriate for, you know, is, is a kind of training of the self and education, a kind of human being that does not fit the requisites of someone to be a citizen. Today, we don't say the police negate the principle of equality because the idea is when they are, when they put on the uniform and the badge, they're no longer, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe or whatever the case may be. <coughs> now, they are abstracted from that concrete reality and represent some kind of public, you know, they're public servants. They're no longer private individuals. Or if you look to uh, the corruption rules when it applies to the elected officials, all the distinctions between are they functioning as a public servant, as a private individual, or as a candidate, which is a neither one or the other is a difficult case for the ethical rules to, so it treats them as being, you know, completely strict, you know, there's a whole third set of rules that apply to you when you're a candidate for office as a political, because then you're, you're neither public official nor private uh, individual, private citizen. But even, for example, that term of private citizen would be unthinkable in the context of what Castoriadis is examining here how Aristotle defines the, the city and the citizen. Because what does it mean to be a private? Of course, everything has to be public in the concrete sense, that it is done together, you know, in public rather than it is hidden, you know, within the confines of the household. Uh, so it's a very different set of uh, ideas. It's not long, you, know, you can't have representation, but you are only you. They're not you plus some abstraction. And the Marxist, of course, if you read Paul Shekhanis on, on, uh, on the, the form of law or other issues, of course, Marxism understands this as a product of uh, commodity fetishism. Because when 
the marks in, in chapter one of capital. The distinction is between, of course, a commodity use value, exchange value, and that interplay, where the one, of course, exchange value, only exists in an abstract sense. The exchange value of a commodity, which is the no social necessary labor time that it embodies, only exists in it in an abstracted way. There's nothing concrete, because the concrete constitution of the commodity is all about its use value. You know, how good or bad is the coffee? Was it hot? Is it cold? What kind of bean was it? What kind of was the machine clean or dirty? That's all about it. And, and what makes it three dollars, let's say, in uh, Manhattan price is three fifty. Uh, is abstracted from its concrete constitution. So it's exactly the same idea, for example, in the idea that Donald Trump is both private citizen and public servant. That. One minute he may be, of course, Donald Trump with his personal uh, friendships and interests and all the rest, but at a different moment he's abstracted from that reality and he exists as an impartial public servant, you know, as an embodiment of the interests of the country as a whole. You know, again, it's like the cover of the Hobbes, the Leviathan, the men who become the one. You know, here you have the symbolic representation of the many who become, have become the one. Because also us, when, when next week we read Karl Marx on the Jewish question, is exactly the same idea. You know, we exist in the modern world both as members of civil society and as members of the political community. But in bourgeois society, our concrete existence is only the first. And the second is only, Marx says, in an abstract sense, in a symbolic sense. In a, in, a, in, a, in a way, in a very unreal sense. So what is real about us is the eating and the shitting and the reproducing. It's all the stuff of civil society, and our political nature is abstracted only in an abstracted sense, as it exists in a kind of fantasy. Yeah. But these distinctions themselves, if we read someone like uh, Alfred Song Ruffin, in the wonderful book, Intellectual Manual Labor, he has this idea which is an important idea of the concrete abstraction, which is an abstraction not in thought but in action. And when you go to the market to exchange the 350 for the coffee, the action is asserting their equivalence. Right? When you make the exchange, you're saying that 350 is equal to a cup of coffee. In your mind, that's not what you're thinking. Because if they were the same, you could drink them money. You know what I mean? They're not, we know they're not the same. We approach it in, the, in terms of its concrete constitution, in terms of utilities, and because I want to have the coffee, I, I give the money for the coffee. But my action says they are the same. The action says they are the same. And so Ruffle says, you want to understand contemporary societies and the kinds of abstractions and the possibility of science, for example, it only comes about once you have the abstraction in practice, then people is the Marxist answer to Kant, in a sense. Son Rethel is giving a Marxist answer to Kantian epistemology, saying these things don't exist in the abstract. Is being that determines consciousness. Because human beings engage in concrete abstractions, they become capable and, and adapt to then to abstraction of thought. <coughs> That's why we can, of course, there are debates over this. That's why he says mathematics observe, uh, is created in the place that it, it is created and by the people it's created by because of the increased use of money and the increased abstraction. And concrete abstractions then make more, more possible uh, the intellectual abstractions of philosophy and mathematics and the rest. So it's not some kind of, you know, structure of the brain or some kind of divine influence. It is social being that determines consciousness. And there are abstract actions as well as abstract thoughts. <coughs> so, no notion of representation, no 
presupposition that one could be other than themselves in the context of thinking about or being active in political life. You're only active as you. And because that's true, that's why we mentioned before, uh, if you concretely are in a, in a position where you're not able to deliberate in a thoughtful way on this, you're excluded from that discussion. Because you can only be you. And if you are Well, we'll, we'll, that'll be more obvious when we do part three of the people versus the state. But let's go to part two on the people versus the experts. Linked to the principle of direct democracy is the Greek view of experts. Not only legislative decisions, but important political ones on matters of government are made by the ecclesia after it has listened to various speakers, possibly including those who claim some specific knowledge about the affairs at hand. There are not and cannot be experts on political affairs. Political expertise or political wisdom belongs to the political community. For expertise, techni, is in the stri in the strict sense is always related to a specific technical occupation, and is of course recognized in its proper field. Thus, Plato says in, in Pythagoras, the Athenians will listen to technicians when the when the building of proper walls or ships is discussed, but will listen to anybody when it comes to matters of politics. War is, of course, a specific field entailing a proper technique, and thus the war chiefs, the strategi, are elected, as are the technicians in other fields charged by the police with a particular task. So Athens was, after all, a politia in Aristotle's sense, since some, and very important magistrates, were elected. So there, here we have, again, the distinction. Because in Aristotle, when he discusses three kinds of constitution, kingship, aristocracy, and uh, politia. The question is, who is the best at passing judgments? The one, the few, or the many? The one and the few, Aristotle says, in a, he talks about them as categories, but in effect he says, it's never the case. It's never going to be the case that the one is the best, or even that the few are the best. Because when it comes to matters of good and bad, When it comes to, in that sense, strictly political judgment, all of us are equally capable because we live in the society. And as he says, the best judge of something are the people who use it. Because we are the city, we live in the city, we constitute the city, we are going to be the best judges of what might be the best way to live. And there is no, it's not a technical question, it's a, a political question to its core. Now. War making, he says, is a technical question. And in that sense, we can elect people because there is the best. Not everyone is the best, but some are gonna be better than others, so let's elect the generals. If the question is the architecture of the buildings, let's elect, let's choose who we think is the best at designing the buildings or at engineering some kind of public works projects. But when it comes to the question of should we have or not have this building, or should we collectively, you know, how, how should we organize the city? That's a political matter, and everyone is the best. There's no expert when it comes to politics. There's no political expert. You can have technicians, but everyone in politics is an expert with the caveat that some people, again, because of their concrete situation, may not be in a position to fully exercise that judgment, such as slaves, women, and so forth, the people we knew were excluded. Some may be excluded for completely arbitrary reasons. Some may be excluded for historically arbitrarily, arbitrary reasons, but for reasons that, are, that make sense in that context. A, that, for example, as we mentioned last time, to be a citizen, you need to have the time. If you're busy and you don't have time, you cannot be a citizen, because being a citizen means that you actively share in the holding of public office. And we could say, presupposes, you have time to think. Presupposes well. Time to think. But I mean, like you're not busy all the time. But to have all that time to think, you, you would have, have a certain amount of wealth. Yeah. You cannot be poor, yes, yeah. that's true. 
that kind of, that's, true. that's why <coughs> Michael's friend Nietzsche says, you know, how can we have <laughs> philosophy if you get rid of slavery? Yes. If everyone has Mark to work. Mark, Mark said it, it too. That. Not only Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> Civilization is built on that. Yeah. Both, both are very well aware of that. <laughs> so, I mean, some of this, of course, as we read this from the past, yeah. there's a contemporary critique and, and, yes. and we need to be aware of uh, the time, right? So one of the things that I'm curious is how do they explain taking politics out of technology, right? So so let's go back to that building thing, yes. right? So people, people in the polity or the democracy will, will probably decide the planning of the city, right? That's fine because that's, that's political. A poli that's a political that's a, question. That's, that's a, a common, political question. Right. But wouldn't the actual construction of the building itself also be political? You know, if you don't build a ramp, for example, so it's a political decision. Uh, if you if you choose to have a tomato harvester, uh, it displaces labor. That's a political mm -hmm. thing. I, right. I mean, so how choice of material. That's right, because all kind of technology is also is political in that sense, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just yes. trying if to the see, question is, does for this example, hold today? But if the question, as he says here, how to build the wall, right. and there, there's a technical element to it that you don't want the wall to, to fall, That's or right. you want to build to withstand, you know, if you're building in Athens, it might be an earthquake, you want, you want maybe, you, there are certain technical dimensions to how you build. When the question is the spatial, Organization of the city, let's say, that's that. It that would be, as you say, a political question. And then a part of the politics is deciding what is technical and what is political. That's right. Yeah, that's in that sense, yes. right. it's so not it's not a objective uh, distinction necessarily. That itself is is is. Uh, How do you decide who are the experts? You elect them. No, Th they're elected. Yeah. No, I was going to say. I mean. Would that be his answer to also economic policy? Well, it depends, because, you know, part of the contemporary dilemma, because I will mention last time you have all these questions about democracy today, democratic socialism, workplace democracy, and all the rest. The idea here is when it comes to technical matters, it's not amenable to democracy, because some are better at it than others. Mm -hmm. You cannot have everyone, me and Chris and you know everybody passing judgment on you know the the strength of the steel and what kind of steel should be used to build this building is because some will know much better than others on the technical dimensions of such things. Would other experts be the ones who elect the expert? No, no. The the best judge of the expert, he says, are the people who use it. Okay. That's right. So so uh, uh, if you want to decide on the architect for the building. It's the people who live in the buildings, let's say, right? The people who use the buildings, they're going to be the best judges of these kinds of things. If you want to understand the best producer of steel, it's the people who use the steel. So then you would have, let's say, the, 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 the blacksmiths or the people who are working the construction, they would be the ones to decide which steel is, is the best, let's say. And it depends where the on source the use. is from? Local steel, Chinese steel, whatever. Right? I mean, those are the decisions that then become... Japanese. Local. Japanese. <laughs> That's okay. Right. 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 That's a personal thing. <laughs> right. well, coming back to, I mean, once we take over, uh, is Rick Wolf the economic you know, minister of finance, or uh. are we just all... Just <laughs> 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 it depends, yeah. Rick no, once because the question of... Over, when we get to the question of the new life and the good life, mm -hmm. the city versus the household, yeah, we'll but make a minister if, if the question is, as long as he comes to us. If the question is, is you know, when they, the economists draw the graphs, <laughs> you know, guns or butter, that's a political question. Now, how are we going to design the guns and, you know, what caliber and what kind yeah, of steel, yeah, yeah. that would be then, you know, Rick is not going to be good for those, maybe, I mean, maybe he's hiding some stuff from us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We no, don't, no, no, that no, would don't necessarily be... Yeah. Something for <laughs> even for though it's very militant for in New us Haven or, or during the but battle, but right. it all comes to guns and yeah. 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 and it's all yeah. of us who would be, who would be, it would be a political question. It's not a technical question. So it, it so it's a you know it's a and then you know depending on the political principles that the community embodies, you know, it, then that that's then another issue in making these decisions. How are you going to make the decision between? the production of 
golf courses versus, you know, uh, schools, for example. And we might say in the new society, we're not going to allow for, you know, we're not going to have golf courses. It's a political decision. It's a political decision. Why? Because the, 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 the way of life embodied in golf goes against the political principles of the community. But that, but that, uh, and we will deport them it. to, you know, Florida or some, you know, people who want to play golf can move to Florida. Uh, yeah. But that presumes the knowledge, like, you know, economics, you need to know the effects of the consequences of certain decisions. And that's something, and I guess in that process, everyone needs to be up to date. With, uh, <laughs> well, that's why you need time to be a citizen. That's why you have to have a lot of time yeah. and hang out all, all day and, you know, yeah. and sit <laughs> under the olive trees with some nice wine. Uh, and why work? Cafes and, uh, yeah. yeah. I think Baraboy has, like, an interesting assuming that all knowledge is political, basically. Yeah. Uh, and then he draws some distinctions uh, between, I don't remember all the four different categories, but something like along the lines of policy sociology, so like, um, or like the academic, more like what we understand as academic field, or then uh, public sociology, more subjective, like to critique and direct interaction. So that's some Ma Michael scheme. Burroway. Yeah. So yeah. such a scheme, like I find interesting, starting from the Persian position and understanding that all knowledge is political, after all. Well, in, in a even sense, but, but you can knowledge. see the distinction between politics and, you know, and, 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 technique. and technique here, because if the question is, what is the best way of understanding Gramsci? Then we can't say everyone is the same, everyone's no. opinion is, counts as the same. If the question is, you know, is should we be conscious or unconscious philosophers, or what? That that's a political matter. Mm -hmm. Some people, as we know, prefer Absolutely. not to know. You know, better to be stupid than not know. And you know, you can be happier maybe than than to. And that, we cannot say. You know, Max Weber says the same thing in Science as a Vocation. You know, obviously, by virtue of our choosing, let's say, a, a, a life in science or in the academy, we are making it a value statement that we think it's better to know than to not know. But we can't necessarily say that's the, the best thing to do, or everyone should live like this, you know? For the people, you know, how people should live, we don't know. That's a political question. That's a political question. So all normative questions are political questions, even, even if they require vast sums of technical The knowledge. normative question that, yes, that, well, that when it applies to the community as a whole is, there's no, as we said last time, there's no objective standpoint from which then to deduce what is the good, what is the just, what is the best or not best. When technical matters, there is. It's from the standpoint of the outcome, you know. If you, if you want to know who is the best designer of a ship, we'll find out. And some people will drown, you know, and other people won't drown, and we'll say, well, that's, that's the better design of the ship. Or the generals, you know, you see the outcome of the battles, and you say, well, this person was much more capable as a general than others. But that's an important distinction. And you know, it's an, and, and we'll get to the question of self-limiting strategies in a minute, but it's an important one today, for example, because we have the idea that someone like a Kavanaugh or you know, some of these other jokers on the Supreme Court, they're better than we are in deciding you know, what is prudent and good and, and just in terms of maintaining the principles of, of uh, so-called uh, democracy in America or the American uh, Republican system of government. Whereas Aristotle would say that everyone should be good and, help him, and he specifies how the Athenians limited, had a self-limiting strategy because in a sense the constitution as such, the notion of higher law exists as a limit to the legislature, to the legislative uh, functions of government and saying there'll be some things that you won't be allowed to do. And we'll set up a mechanism that will keep you from doing that. So they say you cannot pass laws that violate people's property rights or uh, you cannot put people in jail without due process or whatever the case may be. And we'll have a system that will limit you. There was no such system in the, for example, Athenian democracy. There was no notion of higher law. It's antithetical to the notion of we are self-created and we are the ones who will get to decide. But there were procedures for calling out someone when others thought they were suggesting someone that was antithetical to the principles of the community. 
So if you suggest something that in hindsight was damaging to democracy or to the quality of the citizens, you could be thrown out of the city, for example. Other horrible things could happen to you. And we'll get to that. So you don't need to have a court, but the people themselves take responsibility, the citizens themselves. You know, and if Michael takes advantage of the heat of the moment, you know, and suggests a law that after the fact was not, it was in conflict with some basic principles of our society, we could throw him out, say, you know, you weren't thoughtful when you made that, you know, when you, when you Who suggested Who would decide this. that? The demos. The demos itself. The demos, not, yeah. an, not the experts. No, there's no experts. There's no such thing. Well, it's interesting, you know, the, yeah, the, the French in, after May of 68, the model was created the People's Tribunal. Of course. It was a question of popular justice, which is very much modeled on this. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting that they have these tribunals of where they, yeah, but actually try people. That so acting as a magistrate is, is dangerous because the demos can decide to exile you and throw you if, out. If, you, if you're not thoughtful, if you suggest some new idea, right, some new initiative, that is not well thought out. And after the fact, we said, look, you took advantage of the situation. It was a moment of heated emotions, and you suggested something that in hindsight you should have never done. It was not, then you can be thrown out. Or well, that suggests that these things are, they're, they're reasonable and valued and, and deliberated, but the de demos decides on its own whether you did something right or wrong. Yes. It's it's um, amorphous. It's not like that you really did something wrong and the demos comes like some furies and yanks you out we'll, of the we'll, society. We'll read, we'll read in a minute. You don't think they should, yeah. you think they should have built a new stadium in the Bronx, Yankee Stadium? Spend but, all that money, displace all but, those people, and then they but never suppose even you the suppose you, know, you think of the people that had a voice in that. Should be held to suppose you yeah. make something that's utterly rational, but the demos decides you you're wrong and you're out. You're out. That's it. So <laughs> it's not based on 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 a they rational. They have friends in the demos. Well, <laughs> there. there was a famous case in Athens. Saying you got to build a navy, you got to build a navy, and they retired this guy, and they they passed a vote to banish him from the city. I forget who that was. Socrates. Huh? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Socrates didn't build anything. <laughs> <laughs> just just rabble around. But Socrates is a good example. You know, if you yeah. are espousing he, he was, democratic <laughs> notions, yeah, the Mysticles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And yeah. of course, right, you can be. That it goes against the, right. 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 the origins of right. the, you know, the, 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 the principles of the city, and you, you, know, you have to. Was was right. There's no was notion of free speech. People can say anything they want to. No, you can't say anything they want to if the citizens decide what you are saying is detrimental to. Corrupting. The well, yes, corrupt. Yes, in that sense, is yeah. corrupting. But it's Socrates because he was against democracy. So in that sense, yeah. you know, well, the Athenians were were quite. Uh, Correct, mm -hmm. and of course, it's not that they killed uh, Socrates; he committed suicide. It was, yeah. it was but but you're suggesting him. that the demos judges the right thing rather than what no, they No, I'm not say. saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying that's the that's, that's the limiting law. mechanism. Yeah. There's no higher. That's law. the limiting mechanism. There's no higher law. So that's what you, existed. So if you have power to do something in in the polis, and the demos says you did something wrong, just it, the the demos can act whimsically. It can. Right. So can Aristotle's the courts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can the magistrate. So can yeah. the magistrate. Yes. But the best judge will be the many, not the few. And there's no. The and there's he's, no. He's privileging the many yes. over the, uh, the few. Yeah. But we'll get. Wait, wait one yeah. minute. We'll do the community versus the state. Then we'll get to these, the ways that, as Castoriadis explains, okay. they limited themselves in terms of the, the internal mechanisms rather than constitution what they had for those cases where maybe someone has an idea that is in conflict with some basic principles and you have to have a way of, of noting that. Well, I'm just trying to remember the name of the, during, during the war, the um, Milesia, was it, where they sent out the fleet because the, the city wouldn't join them against Sparta, so they just sent out the fleet to destroy the city, but then they had a change of heart and voted to, not, you know, the Battle of uh, Salamina. Salamina. No, 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 no. This was um, 
when when there was a decision to destroy this city that wasn't joining them against uh, Sparta, it, it, and then they had a change of heart and they sent uh, another ship. They weren't paying the taxes. They didn't want to pay the taxes. Oh, I thought they didn't want something to, like yeah. They didn't want to give the, so the men. They didn't want to join the war basically. Right, yeah. But then they decided that it was pretty harsh to destroy the whole city, so they gave a, a second ship and they gave them double rations so that they would row real fast. And, and they got there just ahead of the first ship and countermanded it. So I mean, yeah. I'm just wondering what, what that process was when they decided they had made a wrong decision. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I don't know it's but maybe when we, when we read, when we remember, read yeah. the uh, yeah. VS examples, yeah. like Catherine Yadis, okay. we'll have some some better idea of the, of the mechanisms. Yeah. But maybe third and maybe most important, especially when, when we talk about the, the translating of the terms, mm -hmm. is, uh, as Castoriadis puts it here, the community versus the state. And he says right here that the Greek polis is not a state in the modern sense. The very term state does not exist in ancient Greek. Characteristically, modern Greeks had to invent a word and they used the ancient kratos, which means sheer force. Politia, e.g. in the title of Plato's work, does not mean their stat as in standard German translation, <coughs> the Latin Respublica, is less opposed to the meaning of politia. It means both the political institution slash constitution and the way people go about common affairs. It is a scandal of modern philology that the title of Aristotle's treatise, Athenon Politia, is everywhere translated the Constitution of Athens. Hmm. Both a straightforward linguistic error and the inexplicable sign of ignorance or incomprehension on the part of very erudite men. Aristotle wrote the Constitution of the Athenians. Thucydides is perfectly explicit about this. Andres gar polis, for the polis is the men. <coughs> for example, here we have the Battle of Sa uh, uh, Salamis. Before the, ba the Battle of Salamis, when Themistocles has to resort to latch this argument to impose his tactics, he threatens the other allied chiefs that the Athenians will take their families and their fleet and found the new their city in the west. This notwithstanding the fact that the Athenians, even more than for other Greeks, their land was sacred and they took pride in their claim to attack them. The idea of the state as an institution distinct and separated from the body of citizens would not have been understandable to a group. Of course, the political community exists at a level which is not identical with the concrete empirical reality of so many thousands of people assembled in a given place at a given time. The political community of Athens, the polis, has an existence of its own. For example, treaties are honored irrespective of their age, responsibility for past acts is accepted, etc. But the distinction is not between a state and a population, it is between the continuous corporate body of perennial and impersonal Athenians and the living, breathing ones. No state and no state apparatus. There is, of course, in ancient Athens, a technical administ administrative mechanism but does not possess any political function. Characteristically, this administration, up until including its higher echelons, police, keepers of the public archives, public finance, is composed of slaves. Possibly Treasury Secretary Don Donald yeah. Reagan and certainly Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker would have been slaves in Athens. <laughs> <laughs> These slaves were supervised by citizen magistrates, usually drawn by lot. Permanent bureaucracy, the tasks of execution, in the strict sense, is left to the slaves. Executing the bureaucracy, not executing people. Both. 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 Oh, wow. Both. oh yeah, the Greeks were very fast. <laughs> <laughs> but the military was not. Military. And the military were all citizens. Citizens. By, you know, that, that had to be, that, you had to be a citizen of the military. Yeah, well, the designation of magistrates yeah. through lot or rotation, in most cases, ensures participation by a great number of citizens in official tasks and knowledge of those tasks. The Ecclesia decides all important governmental matters, ensures the control of the political body over elected magistrates, as does the fact that they are subject to what amounts in practice to the possibility of recall at any time. Conviction in a, jur in a juridical procedure entails inter alia that they lose their office. Of course, all magistrates are responsible for their performance in office as a matter of routine. Accounts are given in the classical period to the uli. So, there is a strict separation of thinking and passing judgment versus executing. All matters of execution are left to technicians, slaves. So all the information business. That's right, exactly. 
because A, as we, might, as we said before about the police, the kind of people that are appropriate to political life are different than the kind of people appropriate to being technicians or being bureaucrats. So you want to not contaminate citizens with those kinds. And you want to maintain the principle of equality in a very concrete, very literal sense. E equality politically means that you don't have some citizens in positions of authority over others. So we would have to, and that's, I mean, I said, you know, for something like police today, either they would have to renounce their citizenship or you have some kind of guest, you know, exchanges with other, you know, they come from Colombia here to become police and then you send from New York some people to Colombia to be police there. You have some kind of rotation. Now, on this question of self-limiting strategy, is on, on this page, on page 116, I'm not sure on your page. Now, the idea of, 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 of self-limiting strategies, um, the classical example is from uh, Odysseus, you know, with the sirens. You know, when they go with the ship and the sirens, the call of the sirens, and they, Odysseus was smart. So he wanted to hear the music of the sirens, but he knew he would crash the ship. So he had the sailors. He was lashed to the mast. Tie, yes, tie him to the mast, and they had to put wax in their ears, so. Yeah. They the did, but he said, didn't. He, but not no, so he yeah. could, he, yeah, so he could hear the, the music. Now, that would be a self-limiting strategy. You see? You know you want to do something that you don't want to happen, so you beforehand limit your freedom, limit your activity, so when that time comes, you're, you don't do what you know otherwise you would do. Now that is, for, that's the notion of the Supreme Court, for example, in the Constitution, right? We know there's a tendency towards democracy and towards faction or whatever the case may be according to the James Madison and the others. So we're going to try to preclude as much as possible some of these dangers. Now, to do that, to have Constitution in that sense, in, in the contemporary sense, would be anti-democratic, yes. obviously. It's not to say, of course, that he says here the ancients didn't have a way. So he says, this is on page 116. How, <coughs> how many pages after the state? Uh, uh, the and these pages, it's about four or five pages. So maybe two. What's the paragraph to start with? In, in, in Greek practice and thinking, yeah. the distinction between constitutional law does not exist. Okay. It says here, the Athenian distinction between laws and decrees of the Ecclesia did not have the same formal character, and in fact disappeared during the fourth century. But the question of self-limitation was dealt with in a different way, and I think more profound way. I would only consider two institutions related to this problem. The first is an apparently strange but fascinating procedure called graphi paramanon, accusation of unlawfulness. The procedure can be briefly described as follows. You made a proposal to the Ecclesia, and this proposal has been voted for. Then another citizen can bring you before a court, accusing you of inducing the people to vote for an unlawful law. You can be acquitted or convicted, and in the latter case, the law is annulled. Thus, you have the right to propose anything you please, but you have to think carefully before proposing something on the basis of a momentary fit of popular mood and having it approved by a bare majority. For the action would be judged by a popular court of considerable dimensions, 501, sometimes 1,001, or even 1,500 or one, or one citizens sitting as ju judges drawn by lot. Thus, the Vimos was appealing against itself, in front of itself. The appeal was from the whole body of citizens, or, who, or whichever part of it was present when the proposal in question was adopted, to a huge random sample of the same body sitting after passions had calmed, listening again to contradictory, arg contradictory arguments, and assessing the matter from a relative distance. Since the source of law is the people, control of constitutionality could not be entrusted to professionals. 
In any case, the idea would have sounded ridiculous to a Greek, but only to the, the people themselves acting in a different guise. The people say what the law is, the people can err, the people can correct themselves. This is a magnificent example of an effective institution of self-limitation. Tragedy is another institution of self-limitation. People usually speak of tragedy, but there's no, no such thing. There is only Athenian tragedy. Only in the city, where the democratic process, the process of self-institution, reaches its climax. Only there could tragedy, as opposed to simple theater, be created. <coughs> tragedy has, of course, many layers of signification, and there can be no question of reducing it to a narrow political function. But there is certainly a cardinal political dimension to tragedy, not to be confused with the political positions taken by the poets, not even with the much commented upon, rightly of its efficiency, a Scalian vindication of public justice against private benches, vengeance in the rest of the The political dimension of tragedy lies first and foremost in its ontological grounding. Where tragedy, not discursively but through presentation, gives us all to see is that being is chaos. Chaos is exhibited here first in the absence of order for man the lack of positive correspondence between human intentions and actions on the other, and their result or outcome on the other. More than that, tragedy shows not only that we are not masters of the consequences of our actions, but that we are not even masters of their meaning. Chaos is also presented as chaos in man, that is his hubris. And the ultimately prevailing order is as an uh, Anaximander order through catastrophe, a meaningless order from the universal experience of catastrophe stems the fundamental Iceland of tragedy, universality, and impartiality. So he says, look, we have two, right, self-limiting. For us, in the much more concrete sense, that only the citizens can pass judgment on the lawfulness of their own actions. There is no specialized body of experts that would be capable it would be unthinkable in a contradiction, of course, with the principle of the city being self-created. Then, of course, you have also the notion of tragedy, which is not, which is Athenian. He doesn't mention fate, which is so important in Greek tragedy, Athenian tragedy. Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting that... Well, um, there's the Peloponnesian tragedies, too. Yeah, really well, in the sense that he says chaos, but fate does suggest something other than chaos. Right. It's true. something we don't understand. We, we only understand fate and hindsight. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any tragedy. That's true. The great Freudian insight. Well, I thought it was... No, I, mean, I, I thought it was know, my insight. Yes, yes, but I mean, this, but you, what you suggest is, you know, obviously... <laughs> What Freud said. I'm glad Uncle Sigmund agrees. <laughs> <laughs> that old white German man. <laughs> See, it was only apparent after you said it. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you had to say it first. Yeah. <laughs> but then his, his great <laughs> example, of course, is Antigone. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, which is, yeah. of course, everyone's, you know, from Lacan to the Hegel. You know, and Hegel, everyone, uh, you know, yeah. is the, the great. And then as an uh, illustration of, of course, this point the broader limits to uh, to our subjective, let's say, political decisions that there are. Not just we ourselves are going to be the judges, but there is, a, you know, there are un unintended, you know, consequences. And there's an external world out there that it's not well, reducible to our intentionality, yeah. of course, yeah. and to our yeah. into our decisions. Yeah, but in an Athenian and or Greek uh, tragedy, the, um, the, um, the final commentary is always done by the chorus, which could be representative of the demos, right? I mean, Absolutely, yeah. They do the commentary and the analysis and ultimately close all of the plays, right? It's their comment, commentary. But the hero who undergoes the tragedy yes. is considered someone better than us. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any catharsis. Well, they're better because they come from a class of the aristocracy. Right? Yeah. I mean, all the tragic figures are not from... Yeah. But they are also sacrificial. Yeah. As in Tragos, the goat song. Mm -hmm. 
sacrificial goat. There's a good part here, it's on page 119. And, Antiquity is upholding of divine law is remarkably weakened by her argument that she did what she did because a brother is irreplaceable when one's parents are dead and that with a husband or a son the situation would have been different. To be sure, neither the divine or the human law regarding the burial of the dead recognizes such a distinction. Page 119. It's a, more than a page after. It's right there. Oh, okay. We need not go to extremes of interpretation and invoke incestual attraction, but we certainly must remember that the play would not have been the masterpiece it is if Antigone and Creon were bloodless representatives of principles and not moved by strong passions. Love for her brother in Antigone's case, love for the city and his own power in Creon's case. Against this passionate background, the characters' arguments appear additionally as rationalizations. Finally, to present Creon as unilaterally wrong goes against the deepest spirit of tragedy, and certainly of uh, uh, Sophoclean tragedy. So it's the fuzziness, the, of course, the conflict between laws of nature and human laws. Levi Strauss, when he wrote about um, the uh, um, Orestes and Electra, talked about how he distinguished the laws as overvaluation of kinship versus undervaluation of kinship. He used that as a marker. So we could say that Antigone shows an overvaluation of kinship versus Creon, where there's an overvaluation, I guess. Of, we couldn't say the state. We'd have to say, um, what would the we say? The political community. The political community. The polis? Yeah. He's only obedient. He's only obedient to the to the law of the polis. Right. She's she's obedient to the law of what she considers the law of the family, which is also inspired by the divine law. Mm -hmm. These laws do not belong to you, she says. Right? They're yeah. beyond. Yeah. Which brings us to Aristotle. Yes, that's good. And the city versus the household. The city versus the household. Of course. Now, <laughs> so I think the Cassiodorus is fundamental, and it gives us some important hints in terms of the reading of the, the ancients or you know the, what democracy might mean in the classical world. Of course, I mean, the, in Aristotle's politics, we have very much more direct, of course, statement about what these things are. And he begins, you know, well, let's just begin with a... So before you go on, I just have a question. Do you know yeah. what uh, Habermas and Tugendhat may have said? In this conference, or you just just the speech you know from the politics and autonomy. I mean, this obviously was a conference on democracy at, at the, in Germany. They, they right? had invited Castoriadis yeah. to Germany to speak. This, what we are read just now, right, was a, a seventy nine. Yeah, seventy nine. Yes, that's when he first he gave the paper. The paper and then it we was read. Published at the new no, no. The, the, this is the talk he gave at the new school in 1982. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it departed from the discussion with Habermas in uh, 1979. In a seminar, I right? See. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the the part there, of course, is the idea. Uh, Castoriadis was was uh, um, <coughs> the distinction Castoriadis insisted was the point of being open to other cultures and so forth, other comparisons, is part of the Western tradition. It's not, it is, comes out of the democratic spirit, mm -hmm. the idea that we don't know the answers and we look to other cultures as one guide. You know, we borrow ideas. That's what I said the last time. Uh, something like uh, the book uh, Black Athena is, uh, even though it's a bad title, because racial distinction that exist, of course, in the classical world. Uh, is not, is not a, is of course completely correct, because that the Aristotle and the others readily took ideas from other peoples, other communities, what have you, and that was, and they were explicit about it, there was nothing shameful of, you know. Well, part of the argument of Black Athena is that the, uh, the uh, Greek vocabulary is partially Semitic, He's pointing out the relationship of the Semitic vocabulary into the 
to the ancient yeah, Greeks. Yeah, but the the, 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 the how that plays out. In the broader history, point, and, and that's not because of, of European. That's not part of that, that's not because of Aristotle, that's because yeah. of the European yeah. right. tradition that right. try to claim right. claim to the ancients as their origin yeah. is that of course it's not a in that sense mm. uh, European creation as such because it was okay. part of the larger medieval Greece today. Is, uh, they were borrowing Germany. ideas from right, Egypt and other parts of mm. Africa yeah. and, yeah. and uh, Asia Minor yeah. and so forth. But that at that I mean that's not exactly a yeah. That's explicit in someone like Aristotle. That's the way that you yeah. go about trying to assess what the best way to live might be. You can also compare it to other other places, mm -hmm. other constitutions, how they mm -hmm. created themselves. Right. Right. And maybe there's some good ideas for, for us that we can learn. Right. Right. You know, that's why I said before the notion of uh, <coughs> there's no such thing as a pure culture. It doesn't exist. Right. By definition, it is you know, as uh, it's a kind of axiomatic that each culture is always in a process of changing and it borrows and people borrow from it. And, you know. I mean, Burnell's point is that Greece is the invention of Germany. Modern well, that's Greece true. Is basically yeah. the well, there's no, of yeah, there's no question, question that that's true. And he talks about Germany's tyranny over Greece and you know yeah. how this is constructed all the way up to yes. Schliemann's you know discovery of Troy and the ruins and you know and then how that plays out. And then of course you know the Hitler's uh, Germany is a kind of reductionistic view of these cultures, right? In terms of uh, putting well, together. I mean, our, yeah, yeah. our yeah. good friend uh, Cosentinos Chukalas, yeah, yeah. you know, he's pointed yeah. out, Point and exactly. it's an important. Point that modern Greece right. is one of the few, if there are any other examples, I'm not sure, uh, cases where all the national myths are imported from the outside. Right. You know, like George Washington chopping down the apple right. tree with a yeah. cherry tree, yeah. that's an American, right? You didn't bring, the French didn't bring that to the U.S. Right. The Americans do all these stupid things themselves. You know, these myths. <laughs> the Greeks never had the you know, the opportunity because they came from St. Petersburg and Paris and Berlin and so forth. All these myths about the, the greatness of the Greeks. And, I mean, in fact, uh, I've noted this other places. One of the great uh, figures of the, uh, the Greek Enlightenment, the modern Greek, Cordais, uh, in one of his letters tells the story of, he was in Paris and he went to get a, a state ID, you know, ID card or whatever they would get and they ask, you know, what's your nationality? He says, a Greek, and then everyone froze, you know, complete silence, and people went and touched him to make sure that he was flesh and blood, you know, these great, <laughs> these great and individuals actually <laughs> existed. I was gonna say, there's uh, other examples, I guess, in post-colonial uh, context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess in the British sort of had this regime, we don't know about today, the Pashtuns, they, they, oh. they made a noble salad out of them. And that, the residue of it, you can still can see, you know, in material history right now, because the way the Taliban were mobilized against the, you know, against the Russians and the way they've been. That may, uh, that, 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 that imported myth like still. The warrior myth right. has been instrumentalized in those mm -hmm. imperial projects. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's also from, out, I mean, if you consider yeah. the British an outside force, I would. Well, yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And by expert anthropology, the construction of the myths by yes, expert yeah, anthropology. Yeah, and they have, you know, Working for the long life. Governors, the people who rule, rule at the time, governors, ministers, scholars. But that, I think, these notions should preclude any notion of, for example, as we mentioned before, because we had a cultural appropriation of these kinds. Of, it, it, all cultures are appropriated and appropriated, and it is always that is the process, and if, you know, you put milk in your espresso, I can't say to you, you know, you violated the canon of espresso drinking, you know, we're not. If you're so Italian, you should be frivolous and meaningless in the way that Yeah, of course, of course. Whereas uh, some, some of our uh, comrades have a problem with Hawaiian pizza, <laughs> as you may know. Invented by a Greek, football. In Canada. In yes, Canada. That's true. <laughs> but we have uh, turning to Aristotle, chapter one, book one, and you know it's a very important. Of course, the first section is extremely important for understanding what 
the city is the voice is for the Athenians or what politics is. I'll just read the first few paragraphs. He says, your observation shows us, and I have the Barclay translation, different translations have you know, are not going to be the same, obviously. Observation shows us first that every city, for these, is a species of association. And secondly, that all associations come into being for the sake of all, some good. For all men do all their acts with a view to achieving something which is, in their view, a good. It is clear, therefore, that all associations aim at some good and that the particular association, which is most sovereign of all and includes the rest, will pursue the, this aim most and will thus be directed to the most sovereign of all goods. This most sovereign and inclusive association is the city, or polis, as it is called, or the political association. It is a mistake to believe that the statesman is the same as the monarch of a kingdom or the manager of a household or the master of a number of slaves. Those who hold this view consider that each one of these differs from the others, not with a difference of kind, but according to the number, large or small, of those with whom he deals. On this view, someone who is concerned with a few, with a, with few people is a master, someone who is connected with more is the manager of a household, and someone who is concerned with still more is a statesman or a monarch. This view abolishes any real difference between a large household and a small city, and it also reduces the difference between the statesman and the monarch to one fact that the latter has an uncontrolled and sole authority, while the former exercises his authority in conformity with the rules imposed by the art of statesmanship. Let's continue to chapter two. In this, as in other fields, we shall be better be able to study our subject best if we begin at the beginning and consider things in the process of their growth. First of all, there must necessarily be a union or pairing of those who cannot exist without one another. Male and female must unite for the reproduction of the species. Not from deliberate intention, but from natural impulse, which exists in animals generally, as it also exists in plants, to leave behind them something of, a, of the same nature as themselves. Next, there must necessarily be a union of the naturally occurring element with the element which is naturally ruled for the preservation of both. The element which is able by virtue of its intelligence to exercise forethought is naturally a ruling and master element. The element which is able by virtue of its bodily power to do the physical work is the ruled element, which is naturally in a state of slavery and master and slave have accordingly a common interest. The, the female and in, in the slave are naturally distinguished from one another. Nature makes nothing in a miserly spirit, as smiths do when they make a Delphic knife to serve a number of purposes. She makes each separate thing for a separate end, and she does so because the instrument that is most perfectly made when it serves a single purpose and on a variety of purposes. So he goes on to discuss slaves and you know, natural slavery and the rest. And then in the, the next page is really when we get to some of the, the key elements for what we consider to be citizens and po political, you know, what, what the nature or the goal of political association is. <coughs> it is clear that man, this is on paragraph 1253, it is clear that man is a political animal in a higher degree than bees or other gregarious animals. Nature, according to our theory, makes nothing in vain, and man alone of the animals is furnished with a faculty of language. The mere making of sounds serves to indicate pleasure and pain, and is thus a faculty that belongs to animals in general. Their nature enables them to attain the point at which they have perceptions of pleasure and pain and can signify those perceptions to one another. But language serves to declare what is advantageous and what is the, the, the reverse. And it is particularly of the particularity of man in comparison with other animals that he alone possesses a perception of good and evil, of the just and the unjust, and other similar qualities. And it is the association in these things which makes a family and a city. So he says, look, human beings are political, political animals. That means that, first of all, we are social animals, social beings. We live in communities by our nature. Other animals are like that too, the bees, said the gregarious animals. They live in communities too. 
or the dogs. Maybe they live in packs, you know, they have a community too. But the dog does not have speech. The dog, if you kick the dog, can make a sound to express, to express pleasure and pain. But the dog will not, does not think. So the dogs and the bees, for example, Aristotle is saying here, they don't ask the question, is this a good way to live or not? The bees don't ask the question, well, is this a just way to organize the hive? Or we can improve it somehow, make it more just, more excellent. They don't know. Human beings, however, because we're made with a faculty of language, we have the capacity to speak. Speaking not necessarily in the literal sense, but we can think. We have language and we can think. How many languages Nietzsche says we need to think? One. 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 So we have the capacity of language that we can think, and thus we will start asking questions. Is this the best way to live or not? And who's the expert on that question? No expert. We're all our experts, because we all live in the city. We all can pass judgments on, on these matters. Stuart Schneider. He's yeah. a life, life coach. coach. Life coach. <laughs> so that's what it means. That's what politics is about. That we live together. We're human beings. We can think. And we're not driven simply by instinct. There are some instincts that drive us to reproduce and these kinds of things. But beyond that, we're also political animals. And we can ask questions. Is this a, a good way to live or we can improve it? That's what politics is about, he says. That's what politics is about. And the city exists for that purpose. The city exists for us to figure out what the good way to live might be and to improve on that. And it's an open process through which we try to make ourselves more excellent, more just, more democrat equal or whatever, the more virtuous in that sense. Concurrent to that, we have also his other kinds of associations, the household, for example. And the household exists not for the pursuit of the good life, but as he terms it here, we skipped over that point, for the pursuit of the mere life. The household exists because we have certain needs as animals, right, as human beings. Food, shelter, comfort, clothing, and the rest. And the household exists to address these needs, the, our biological needs as animals. That is the primacy of the household. It exists for that purpose. And the relationship within the household are not going to be, are going to be that the, the different types of relationships in politics or in the city. Because in politics, we relate to each other as equals. Because no one knows the answer. If someone knew the answer, there would be a God. And none of us are gods. So when it comes to politics, in that sense, we approach each other as equals. There is no superior or inferior. In the household, that's not true. So people who think the city is simply like a big household misunderstand the radically different nature and character, he says, of what the purpose of the household is versus the city, number one, and number two, the kinds of relationships that are appropriate to each. Because in the household, you do have masters and slaves, parents and children. And there, you don't have equality. And you can have equality the same way you do in politics where you have it. By definition, we are all. If you can think, you can pass judgment, you can ask questions, we are equal in that sense. Questions? Comments? I mean, when you get to Rousseau, this is very important <coughs> because he says the family can't be the origin of the social contract Yes. because of the inequality that exists in it. That's and Marx saying. and the Holy yeah. Family. Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, Engels, of course, says Yeah, Engels, too, in the origin of family and private property. And stuff. I just yeah. had a comment. Yeah. Yes. Or a talk. Yes. Know. So connecting the, after we had this piece, piece with what you just said now, the last song. So the question of women. Uh, women are not considered to be citizens or capable of doing politics because they don't have time, largely. 
right? Well, Aristotle's, well, that's one argument. All right. Aristotle well, also says continue. women have imperfect reason, but, yeah. All right. So I just want to go with the reason thing. <laughs> that's I what they said the, in the Kavanaugh here. <laughs> so I just want to go with the time, <laughs> time thing because it's a little circular, right? Yes. yes. So, so they don't have time to do politics, but who and what made them not have time? And that's about the way in which they are seen as naturally uh, suited for certain kinds of work, right. which is in the family, in the household, all that stuff. So I'm just trying to think. So I understand Castoridis wants us to look at, why should we bother about ancient Greece? He says it's a joke, right? Yes. And exactly. it's not a model. So right. I, so right. I'm, so I'm 200% with him on that. Right? But there are other germs in other parts of the world which is the contradiction or kind of the non-self-reflexivity that I find in Castoriadis, that he's right, that everything is hybrid, and yet there's a Greco-Western tradition, right? He compares a Greco-Western rationalist tradition with all the rest in that one statement, which are Christian, all Christian, Hindu, Jewish, yeah, Hindu, and yet there are rationalist traditions in other parts of the world. They're not all, even in the midst of Hindu things, there's all kinds of folks who denied the existence of God, actually came close to saying that we make ourselves. Now, other historical conditions prevents, you know, the uh, ancient demos coming in certain places, but, but it is not the lack of a rational tradition. And so I want to come back to this, that the connection between Castoria this and Habermas, for example, seems to be everything about a rational public sphere. There's no affect in there. So how would how would somebody in ancient Greece come to the demos to um, say, well, we should start including women or slaves as citizens? I'm not certain well, how, the, say, how example, the rule of the many Plato, is not the majoritarianism. Plato argued, okay. I think as we mentioned last time, that no, that the fact that women have to work is an accent of history. And it's certainly possible that in a different context, in a different uh, a society, women could be citizens too, because if you can liberate people from the demands of the household, mm -hmm. then you don't have any reason not to include, not, okay. not so, to include them. So, so it, 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 they did have the, the it, of course, it's not. As a rational argument. Aristotle you know. took things as being natural. So some people yeah. say they're slaves by nature. Some yeah. people are slaves by historical accident. They lost the war and they were enslaved. But some people are slaves by nature because they are incapable of leading and being led in turn. They're servile. They only can be led. Uh, of course, we can say, well, this, is, this is, would be an effect of their subjugation, not some kind of natural condition mm -hmm. that, that people Which was used, into. by the way, actively in the 16th century. Is right yes, of course. This of was course. a proposition but that was used in arguments. Already Plato, slavery. of course, before yeah. Aristotle, yeah. had yeah. said the opposite. You see? Yeah. Right. Already before right. he had said right. the opposite. So mm -hmm. it's not as if the ideas did not exist in those days. Even though, in many ways, Aristotle is the much more democratic of the mm -hmm. two. Plato is much more uh, 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 conscious of what might be a historical accident and what might be more trans historical truths about the And society. there were women in the academy. Mm -hmm. Yes. In that's Plato's true, too. academy, there were women philosophers. Yes. He also assumes a nuclear type family is na natural, whereas in other cultures we find that families are, you know, could be grouped into clans. They could be polygamy. They could be a sharing of the children and and one another. So it's not nature to have a, a nuclear oh, and family. And Plato too, he was against in that sense the nuclear family. Thought the children should be raised by the city, right. taken by the parents. So, of course, these, these, these are ideas that even they thought. So, I mean, it's, on the one hand, it's understandable why Castoriadis is, a, in that sense, a partisan for that, you know, that tradition, because that is what allowed him to be able to, to think, you know, some of these ideas and ask, uh, ask some of these questions. But I think he had little uh, um, in common with Habermas, you know, hmm. uh, more broadly in terms of his political sensibilities and all the rest. Yeah. You know, Castoriadis was in, in, and we're gonna, later on in the class, we we're going to read uh, Panakot and Council Communism and all the rest, and that was really his, his political. Yeah, right. 
sensibility was in, was in that vein, uh, which I think Habermas would be f very far from that, that political tendency. Yeah. And I think Castro, uh, Habermas has much more uh, faith in the project of modernity, whereas Castoriadis would not be, I think, as. <coughs> Where does affect, <coughs> affect come into this? Because Castoriadis does talk about beauty and the ability to, I mean, there's aesthetics in it, but in the decision making of the demos, there doesn't seem to be any space for affect. No, no, he has a lot of that. Yeah. If you read the Matrix of Society, there's a lot of that. Right? And even in terms of, uh, if you read, for example, what he says on education and so forth, it's all about affect, Castoriadis. Castoriadis says, for example, to, that to be educated, you have to have a love for the, for the thing. And you cannot be, in that sense, you know, you cannot be coerced into becoming educated. You have to come to develop a love for the thing, a passion. If you don't have the passion, you can't be educated. You know, Michael was not coerced into being a philosopher. <laughs> Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> don't, go to, don't go to law not, school, you'll be bored. Right, yeah, I was coerced. <laughs> you see what that means? So it's, it's, no, there's a lot of that. And, if you, and he, he has a critique of psychoanalysis. And Ford, he himself was an analyst uh, in, in Paris for, 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 for years. And, uh, his, uh, and a mathematician. A second stock of market wife, speculator. But she was a, a very well uh, known Lacanian uh, psychoanalyst. There's a lot of psychoanalysis and libidinal discussions in his work. So this is, I think, the important point in Aristotle, that human beings, by our, we have politics because we not only live together, but we can think so we can question the how we live together. And the purpose of politics is to figure out what the best way of living together might be and, hope, and come up with ever better ways of doing that. And that means we're going to be open to other cultures, as we said. That means we, are, we understand that we are the authors of our own uh, society and we can change how we live and you know, how, the, how we relate to other peoples. And at the same time, that the highest, our higher purpose is not just to reproduce because the as Marx says in the 1844 manuscripts, you know, we are like other animals in that we eat shit and reproduce. That, that's an animal part of our <coughs> nature. What is human about us is that we can create, we can imagine, we can think in that sense. And one of the tragedies of capitalism is that what is human is made animal, what's animal is made human. Human beings today seek meaning in their lives in the family. For example, or in you know uh, household matters, whereas of course this is the, like the dogs and the cats. You know what is really human about it. Is and, but in the workplace where we could be creative, the work in bourgeois society is made mechanistic. We become adjuncts to the machines. So in that sense, we bec it becomes animalistic. Sorry to bother you if anybody has seen it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why, for example, we had another class. A few years ago, that I did with Bruno Bulli. On the idea of the animal. On the idea of the animal, and you know, we have the. I've been writing a little book on that includes a chapter on the dog names. And, it, and that's why I say, you know, the, it's in the last 20, 30 years that humans suddenly start giving human names to dogs. That was not done. <laughs> if you read uh, Claude Levi Strauss, uh, The Savage. Mind. He has a chapter. He has a chapter on animals. <coughs> One question is who has human names? Who has names and who doesn't have names? And, you know, you're, the chickens are not going to have a name necessarily. Yeah, they're, they're just things. Yeah, yeah. They're just things. But some animals we give names to, like the dogs we give names to. Or, and uh, Levi Strauss says, well, the only in the Western tradition, because each different culture might have a different tradition, but in the Western tradition, the only animals humans we give human names to were birds because birds reminded us of ourselves. Ooh. You know, the birds. 
bird. They uh, first of all they desire freedom. So the bird you have to put in a cage or you have to clip the wings, otherwise they fly away. And they live in families and build nests and they have that kind of domesticity. So you had like a pet parrot, you could call it Polly, right? Or Frank or whatever, Johnny or whatever. The dogs, he says, we, humans, we don't give human names to. Because the, the dogs are survive. Marx, Fre Freud says a similar thing. He says, you know, because Freud had a pet dog that he really liked. And then he says at some point, why it's an insult to call someone a dog, given that we like dogs so much. So it's an insult because they have no shame. They shit anywhere. You see what I mean? So it's the same thing as saying you can't think. We also, ha we also assign up, different names for animals depending upon whether we're raising them or eating them. Right. Well, the ones you we have don't cows, give names to. Yeah. But we don't eat cow. We eat beef. We yes, have pigs. True. We don't eat pigs. That's we eat true. pork. So we have, that's true too. Which, you know, we have different <laughs> names when they're palatable. That's true. Chicken is an exception. The stereotype name for a dog used to be Fido. Like Fido, faithful, faithful. Rex. Now it's a phone, no? Like, yeah. uh, like, you know. But Fido, because dogs are faithful. Yeah, can be, yes. Yeah. So but all these yeah. kinds of, now, as you know, I mean, we've talked about this many times, the number one dog name in New York City, for example, is Max. Max? Yeah, huh. that's the most common. Maggie is number two. <laughs> and if you look at the top 20 names, it's about 17 that are human names. So yeah, that's it. Levi Strauss would be, you know, spinning in his grave for him alive because this is a. Now, the question is what can explain this difference? And I think it is, of course, you know, as a, in this sense, a pretty. Dogmatic Marxist that we have gotten to the point where we have become reduced in the contemporary culture to animals. What goes, you know, there's no political judgment that you're asked to pass. You know, you're, you're, you don't have any political life. The workplace is largely is ever more alienated and locking in in, in our creative capacities. So all we, bec I mean, what's the difference between the human and the dog? Couldn't because you look at it the other way, that yeah. we're raising the dog to be a part of the family, so we give them human names because we recognize the dog or the cat as a part of the human family. And, and that might speak more to the alienation that we feel in society. Well, that might, that might explain why so many more people have dogs today, let's say. Okay. But not necessarily the name. Yeah. Well, if you see the dog as p or the cat as part of family, you're more likely to give it a human name. Always, the dogs are part of the household in the broader sense. They well, we they work we work with them. something different. And nowadays, very often, the dog is seen as a child of the family. Yes. 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 To have Peter's a got human lucky. Personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got lucky. Named on yeah. it. Jesus. And, uh, food. Yeah. yeah. He was going to name it Jesus, but that didn't work for his daughter not to get it. You know, get out, Jesus. Come here, Jesus. Pick that up, Jesus. Is I think is a Jesus going away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The name of that dog and the fact that you have a dog are not so that people have the dog as a kind of companion, as a way to try to mitigate the alienation and to think of it as part of the family. Yes, but then is all first of all is the question of we could say part of the propensity for pet ownership can be the desire for mastery. Because yeah. when you look at, if you do a phenomenology of dogs in Manhattan, for example, or you know, m m most of the country, you put collars, you leave them around by the, by the chain, it is a master-slave relationship, right? That's the one it's, it's dimension of it. Care, I think care is also part of well, they, the masters the care for the slaves, too. Way well, you could just <laughs> say it also represents our... Yeah. yeah, they are completely servile, completely dependent upon you, you know, show So you they make up for our lack of agency. Yes, yeah. on one level. On the and other level, on the other level, you have the rise of, 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 of veganism, because what does Aristotle say yeah. here? Humans are like the other animals in that we can express pleasure and pain. But we also have thinking, cogito. We also have thinking, which makes us different. The notion today is that we are sentient beings, which means what? We have the capacity to feel pain 
and on that set in that level we're the same as the dogs or the pigs or the cows which is a, which is a deviation from the way that traditionally people thought of human animal relations because it's a benthamite you, you know where yes, the yes. where we deal with greatest what is good what is what pleasure yes. what is bad to feel pain that's right that's right but it's a, it's it is a a apolitical in that sense it is a a a a, 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 a uh, to you know from stanley has the class on progress and it's going back in a sense right it, it's going back in the progress of human beings recognizing that well what we value most is thinking and pain is something that exists in nature and we have it and the cows have it and the dogs have it and okay people are going to there's going to be pain in the world and suffering that's fine i mean that's you know but to the, say but that you have a dog you dis you're devaluing thinking i didn't say that i said that <laughs> i'm asking no, are you I'm saying? saying that if we if Chris, we get very quick see, on these deductions yeah. <laughs> i'm saying if we, we see that there is a shift in contemporary culture in terms of the names given to pets dogs in this case now that transformation, I'm saying, doesn't fall from the sky. There's something going on in contemporary society that, that leads to that. <coughs> and then it's a question of how we wouldn't, how, now I have my explanation. You might disagree. But then I can ask you the question, how do you explain why there's been this shift in? How do I explain what? Yeah, the, the, that Should humans be. never gave human names to dogs because by the, you know, including the time Levi Strauss is writing this in 1961, and today it's the 17 out of 20 most common dog names in New York City are human names. So, as opposed to calling it Lucky, you call it Rosie, and there's a difference of of relationship. That in itself is different. I'm not saying that 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 the relationship is different. I'm saying that in this culture, in this society, we see a difference in how people what people named the dogs. And that was different from what we would have found in this place 40 years ago, 50 right. years or 60 but you're, years you're, ago. You're, yes. Yes. But your analysis is also a class analysis because you're looking at neighborhoods and uh, yeah. class position That's and class true. If you relations. look at the zip codes, if right. you look the at the zip, zip codes, codes right. the more bourgeois the neighborhood, the more likely to give human names. Right. Yeah. If you go to East New York, <laughs> the most common names are like Rocky, yeah. Butch. <laughs> Butch is a human name. Well, no. It's like, nobody knows what's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what's that shortened for, Chris? What's that shortened for, Butch? Doing? butch. Do butch. people just name someone Butch? No, he's no, saying that's a, a dog. That's oh, not a human oh, name. And I'm thinking Butch. The only Rocky, person I know Rocky, Rocky, that name is Rocky very could be a human name, too, but it's more a nickname. It's not a Butch Cassidy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. Butch, Butch Stewart, Cassidy. He owns yeah, right. like all of the hotels. We're like really in trouble when we hear a lot of Cassidy's out there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think also Hop the along. distinction, like the past few decades, between like uh, what is human and what is animal, like based on the understanding that animals mm -hmm. don't feel like or don't have feelings, we by now we know it's not true. So uh, science also is like has offered some. Mm -hmm. Like but the, yeah, but again, the distinction was not if they have feelings, if they feel. The question was, can they think? Or understand. So that was so now Aristotle said. In fact, he said, you know, not only humans can think. He said only we have the capacity for speech. But he said other animals think in their way. The virtue of being a tree and the virtue of being a human are not the same. But the trees have their form of understanding too. So when the light shines, the the leaves turn to the light, for example. You know, it has their way of that, that. That has a way of thinking in, in, in itself. It was Plato who argued in this case talking about it. Plato who argued only the humans can think, or Descartes, as you know. Well, you're saying also think. to speak. Which is contested, right? Yes, but that that's yes. You, we Aristotle says we designate that. a human Aristotle as somebody that. who can speak. Well, what I'm pointing out is the following: the, dis the the discussion of human and animal and what makes us different or what you know are was always in terms of cogito. And the question was, can only the humans think or also some of the animals can think? Or they think in a different way than us, whatever the case may be. Today, that's no longer the discussion by and large. The discussion today is, do the animals feel pain? So when you are in Brooklyn and you have, you know, 
the, the, the Orthodox or the Hasidic Jewish community has to kill the chickens, the vegans go crazy and say, look, these animals are suffering. They're being, there's pain. There is pain. Yes, there is pain. But the question before was not, can the chickens feel pain, but rather, can they think? And if they were, they had cogito, then the question was, wait, wait a minute, maybe we should, you know, don't kill them, maybe they have some value beyond eating them or getting rid of our, our sins. Mm. Mm. I, think, I think part of the, you know, last time we did the, uh, the, the, the seminar on techniques of servitude, we read Freud's, I think you were here for that, Chris. Uh, the, uh, economic problem. Economic of masochism. problem of masochism. Yeah. And the, the guilt is certainly a certain, because we have a very masochistic society today, as you may know. Mm. You know, Trump is exhibit A, you know, in terms of uh, people uh, supporting these kinds of things. And part of it is guilt. In, in the, I think the increasing disparity between the uh, uh, symbolic cultural demands placed upon us and then the real urges and in that sense you know the, the passions uh, that exist so I think if we had a symbolic killing of chickens every <laughs> couple of months to get rid of some of that guilt it might be a, well we also a, a are a society yes we're a yeah. society of victims of no, not actually, but in, 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 that, in that masochistic tendency. Then does that explain why we were a society of victims? Everyone is a victim. There's a, I mean, Trump is a victim. There's a witch hunt after yes. him. Yes, men are the great Kavanaugh was a, a victim. <laughs> Ford was a victim. Everybody claims their per place in society based on their victimhood. No? It could be. Including the Me Too movement. By the way, I, I, I was mistaken last week. I think I mentioned Ford was... The, work, uh, the internships, yeah. internships and that was not that was some right wing thing. Oh, was it? It, it was not oh, true. Shit. It, was, yeah, it was not true. That sucks. <laughs> the broader point was true that you know these people are of a, of a, of a similar type mm -hmm. in, the, in the suburbs. Yeah. They're not yeah. exactly yeah. you know yeah, but that that point was not. Uh, yeah, just uh, going back to the dog thing. In, in my society, we don't call dogs, we don't attribute human names, yeah. and in the rare cases that there is, always the name is an American name. So <laughs> <laughs> and th 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 that is the question of whether it's an insult or a compliment, because my, my good friend, Carlos Fra, that we used to teach together for many years, you know, he, came, he comes from a little town in the north of Spain, so he told me, because they always had dogs on the farm. They would name their dogs after the American presidents, you know, Reagan, <laughs> you know. And obviously, it was an it was an insult. But if today in this culture, if you give the dog a human name, some people give because, you know, I live on the Upper West Side. I take the dog to R Riverside Park. You know, we walk it. So you meet the other dogs. So then I I do my research and I I ask questions, of course. You know, what's the dog name? And they'll say, Oh, this is. This is, you know, I don't know, Frank. And I said, oh, that's such a, you know, how did you come up with the name? I want to see, you know, but sometimes it's like, oh, I had an uncle. That, Frank was Frank. that, that to me is a little bit, because mm. other people would say you name the dog after someone like an insult, like Reagan or Bush, but uh, now it's. I come from the Upper East Side and in our dog <laughs> run, even worse. the it's dogs, even worse the the dogs <laughs> called Ar Armani. Oh. <laughs> really? <laughs> the Maybe east side is color? even more alienated than bourgeois than the west side. I'm, I'm, I'm as concerned about the fact that there are people who really, are really dogs that I've been the dog one and they're going, hey, I'm on. Mommy <laughs> of the dog. Yes. Oh, that's, oh, yeah, that's creepy. That's why my dog has got yes, a working know, class know. name. And, and like Rosie like the Riveter, you know. That's true. The name's Mitchell. Yes. And the goal. Because, you know, we were colonized by the French, and I can think of, uh, I don't think the dog's still alive, but I can think of two names where I remember when I was a little, little kid, they, there were two, two dogs that I can think of. One of them has the name Mitterrand, which is a French president, yes. and the Gaulle, which was a mm. And it was an insult. It was not a comment. Yeah, it was, it was an insult, course. yeah. I mean, sometimes, because when, when I'm in the park, and they ask me, what's your dog's name? I size up if my daughter's with me I can't do because she gets upset <laughs> I'm by myself I size up the person and I say Jesus <laughs> or, or you know Moses or whatever I try to 
So then I see the reaction. I said, like a measure. <laughs> Once, it, but it's now rare that someone gets upset when I say Jesus. Oh, what the, you know, what the interesting name. Of <laughs> One time, but she, she were they neighbors. They probably so think you're didn't. religious for him. Right. They might, because they, they would be an insult, right? My dog, Jesus. That's a good for, thing. Yeah, maybe. Many people would yeah, consider it an insult, but some people understand it. <laughs> so this There's is. something else, too, in this. Long ago, there was a debate about why is it that Americans don't eat dog? Right? It has got protein, and there's a materialistic, historical thing about the dog, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the pig industry and the beef industry versus the possible dog industry that could have come and that was not allowed to. Yeah, so sure. there's some issue of quasi-humans, yes. how dogs were initially uh, you know, for for the disabled people. There are laws yeah, against right. and mistreatment all the cultures of dogs. Have, have some right. notion That's of right. the sacred animals and yes. the profane animals. Right. And in the West, the dogs are we, because they're so close to us. Yeah, they come and sleep in your bed. So. And now, no, 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 no. We, we, no, we no longer eat horses, but we used to eat. Horses. That's right. And my dog's name is Alexi. My grandmother used to eat.